is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever amen Well, good evening. It's a great way to start. So it's been an awesome week so far. It's always great when Daniel Feaster's here. He's uh, kind of one of my favorite guys to have around. So, man, I know what you mean about this squeaky board. You gotta get that fixed. <laughs> that's uh, that's a Daniel Logan problem right there. I'm stepping <laughs> right on a Daniel Logan problem. So. Yeah, he's holding a baby. He can't fix it right now. So tonight what we're going to start with is uh, I'm going to invite Tanya up here. And we're going to start with a reboot testimony. So our reboot program we started this year is for, you got to go this way because you're on camera now. So you got to be in the limelight. Um, our reboot program is for people who just need, just need an opportunity in life to just hit, hit the reset button to figure it out. And the goal of the program is that you leave with some way of sustaining yourself, somewhere to live, and then a, a church community to be a part of. That's the goal. And we spend a year in community um, to try and break some chains and some molds and whatever. Um, so Tanya was our first student. We had four in total, but she was our, like, first student. You... Yeah, you, you taught us a lot of stuff. Uh, and she came, so this is her second summer. She came early. She came last year in June. So, so yeah, so I'm going to just invite Tanya to just share 
what this year was like. Like, what is, if you had to describe to everybody else one highlight, one something, what is, what is the thing that impacted you the most this year? Like, what made it worth it? Um, there's a lot of things that I could talk about, but the one thing that has been really running through my head, and then, I mean, Daniel being here, too, really reiterates that. Um, as I was thinking of coming out here, the words that came through my head were, you're going to the rock to build your foundation. And I didn't really know what that meant. I thought, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to develop a reading my Bible routine. I'm going to journal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do these things because that was the things that I thought that I needed to fix in my relationship with God. Um, but what it very quickly became was an understanding of the foundation of who I am. Um, so last summer, our theme was, um, was identity. No, it was freedom. It was freedom. <laughs> and what came out of that entire summer was freedom in our identity in Christ. So we started to really understand that I actually didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what it meant to be a daughter of the Most High God. Um, I started to hear, hear the terms in church. It was like, we're daughters of the king. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's kind of a fun catchphrase. That's cool. Um, but I, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what it meant to have the freedom to not strive I didn't know what it meant to have the freedom to just be, to learn how to be a mom, to learn how to be me. Um, and then as I moved through and, I mean, talk about the different themes that we went over in as students, hearing from heaven, I thought that was for everybody else but me. Um... I was a different kind of Christian. I didn't actually do that. Um, recognizing, recognizing what offense does and how much control I actually have over whether I carry it or not. Um, stepping into a season right now of learning what rest is. What does it actually mean to rest in God and not just go into my cave? for 24 hours and not, not see anybody but my child. Um, so the year has been, and then like going to some of the stuff that you talked about last night, like just a recognition that in so many ways I'm still a baby and that's okay. Um, there's some solid foundation that I'm still, that's easier to grasp for me now like, oh, yes. Um, understanding how simple things are, how actually simple it is to be a daughter of God, and that it's me that makes it really complicated. Um, so, yeah, it's really the foundation, just the foundation of what does it mean to be a child and know that? And I love, it's been ringing in my head all day. Um, I am a diamond. I already am. I don't have to become. I don't have to become anything. I just get to be me. And as I move through, as I stumble, as I get challenged, as I make mistakes, as I stand back up, all of that dirt breaks off, all of that hard shell breaks off more and more so that I just get to shine. I just get to shine in who I am. So this year has been foundational for me. It really has been foundational. Um, like you get to a point, you start to think like I, I can do, I can do anything. And even when that doubt comes in, I can, I can do anything. I was talking with Pastor Duane a little while ago, and we're talking kind of about my journey, and 
I think something that got me here was stapling papers and photocopying. And now I'm the program coordinator of Rock Lake Ministries. Um, and I wouldn't have decided that for myself. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have chosen it because I wouldn't have thought that I was the right person. Um, and now I don't have to be the right person. I just have to sit with God, and he gets to do that for me. So foundation, the foundation was very different than I thought that it was, but absolutely life-changing. Yeah, come on. So we have, we have two people graduating this year, Tanya being one of them, who is staying with us to be our main female lead for the fall. We already have three students, it looks like, maybe four or five already coming for the fall, which is... Yeah, so she found a job and a home in a community. It just happened to be here. And then, uh, and then Esther's our other graduate who graduates in, uh, in August, and, and she, she's already got all kinds of things happening uh, back in Morden. So, so if you want to know more about the program, if you want to know more about what they learned, like, like pull them aside. They, uh, they've, they've had to have an answer for all kinds of stuff, and they worked really hard to grow in their relationship with Jesus, so they have, they have much to tell. Other than that, guys, let's just let's just worship the Lord. Let's stand. Let's let's get engaged. Let's get involved. Let's not just um, be apathetic. This is an opportunity we get to be in the throne room together, collectively amplifying worship to our King. God is for us, then who could ever stop us? 
And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, our God is greater. Our God is stronger.
have for us as your children. Enlighten our hearts, God. Enlighten the eyes of our hearts to see all the goodness before us, the riches of your inheritance that you've extended to us. Jesus, our brother, our brother, who's gone on before us, who's leading the way, who's paved the way. God, teach us to be your children. Yeah, teach us. God, I know you are. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The Spirit inside us cries out, Abba, Father. We just embrace you, Holy Spirit. Teach us to be children. Maybe we don't know how to be children. Maybe we don't know how to be loved. God, we want to learn. I just invite you, Holy Spirit, to teach us more and more every day to press into that deep, the deep, the deep place that's calling out in our hearts. It's calling out for you. God, teach us, lead us, guide us. We praise you, Father. Amen. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thanks. Thanks for drumming. Hello, check, check, yep, we're live. John and Julie, hey guys, I didn't see you until I was up here on the thing there. <laughs> Welcome, good to see you guys, awesome. We have a few new faces, um, John and Julie have known me my whole life from when I was wee, but a wee babe. And they've been involved with my family one way or another my whole life. And so there's a deep soul connection there. And I'm always warm to see you guys. So thanks for... They actually have a cabin on this lake. So they've, they're very familiar. They've probably been with this camp longer than, longer than the director even. Wherever he is right now. Um, Fred, welcome. Good to see you. So, we have some fresh blood. <laughs> um, I'll do a little bit of a recap, basically, on what we've been talking about this week. So, this week, we've been touching on reconciliation. That's the theme that this, the camp has decided to settle on this summer. And so, they have a number of speakers coming through to, to establish that and to hit it from different perspectives and to, to share what they have to share about it. And it's also family camp. So, we... we we're flexible. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> We're flexible. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been amazing because it's always a privilege to get to teach this stuff. Uh, the first day we really hit hard reconciliation from the perspective of you're not on a journey to reconciliation. You're not being reconciled slowly. Reconciliation is not a process. It is a declaration over your life, Right? It is a one-time deal. You never have to get reconciled again. The blood of Jesus has reconciled you to God once and for all forever. And establishing that fact, we moved on and we talked about how that affects your personal life in terms of how you relate to other people. Um, you're no longer in the rat race of trying to get value. You're not, you're not uh, this is a, a descriptive term, but you're no longer a spiritual vampire trying to suck life out of other people to make you feel good. If you don't give me that lifeblood, then I'm not okay. And if you do, I am okay. I'm not reliant on your pat on my back, right? You're not my former. You're not my God. You're not the one who forms and shapes me. He is. So I wake up in the morning to reach out and love on you, not to expect something from you. And when you don't give it, you fail. And then I get an excuse to cop an attitude, right? Reconciliation solves that problem. And so that's the fight of faith is remaining true to the, the, the idea that God has declared something over you. We talked about how Jesus was challenged with this. And this ties into identity super easy, right? Jesus' identity was challenged in the desert by Satan. If he's doing it to him, he's doing it to you, okay? And he questioned his stance with God. He questioned who 
Jesus was. He told him to prove it. He, t- he gave him all these tests, and he, he was questioning that to put him off because that was the source of Jesus' ministry in life, the Son. When he gets baptized and comes out of the water, what's the voice say? Behold, my beloved employee, right? Who is employee of the month this month? My son. How hard do sons have to work to be sons? Zero hard. (laughs) They don't have to work at all. My lovely little kids can never get out of me being their daddy. They will forever, even if they wanted to. I will be their dad. They will be my kids. No matter what, Dan's giving his old man a big old hug. <laughs> Dave's scratching his beard. <laughs> you can't get out of it. You're stuck, whether you like it or not. And I, I, I've, I love that because what the devil likes to do is he likes to come to you and he likes to give you a measuring stick. He likes to give you a measuring stick that God didn't give you. Right? If you are the Son of God, then meet this measurement. Well, if you really were full of love and believed God, then you would be. And if you really believed, then how come you're not? And we established through Scripture over and over again the law, the rules, the measuring stick cannot make you righteous with God. It cannot. It's not like if you give it your best shot, you'll get there. It, that is not at the end of that rainbow. There's no gold there. You do not get righteousness with God through obeying rules. Impossible. It is declared over you. It is granted. It is gifted. And it's just through saying, Jesus, I believe what you did, and resting in that place, and allowing the Father to love you in that place. And quieting your thoughts. Did anybody get to spend some time alone last night? I know you guys are busy. Yeah? How was it? Yeah? Awesome. Really? And, and not just hearing a message on it and, and, and agreeing. You need to take this stuff to him personally. Um, and so this is something. This is something uh, we're going to talk about tonight. Now that everybody's tired, we're going to do some heart work because your, your boundaries are down. <laughs> I can walk right in there. Um, we're going to do some heart work. This is something that actually I talked with Tyler about this last time. It's something I've been hashing out for the last few months, really. Um, I'm in a leadership role at a, a local church in Niverville, and if you were paying attention to anything the last two years, you know that there's a heck of a lot of hurt and pain and offense and all that sort of stuff and it's taken its toll on family units it's taken its toll on churches it's taken its toll on our communities um big time you may be asking what does this have to do with reconciliation has a lot to do with reconciliation a lot to do with reconciliation um so tonight i want to hit forgiveness and i think it's an appropriate step to take. (laughs) We talked about reconciliation with God. We talked about what that means for me and him. And now we're going to talk about what it means this way, right? For me and you, across to each other. And it has to be in that order, right? Like we, we have to understand that we are reconciled, that we're forgiven by God, and that we receive grace to receive the same heart and do the same thing. We're children of God. I'll, I'll, I'll explain this to you straight, man. You were made to forgive. You were made to. Just like your Father in heaven, you were made to forgive. It is your natural state of being. It's what you were created for, to walk in mercy and forgiveness. Isn't that awesome? This isn't some skin you're trying to put on that doesn't fit. All right? This is your natural state. This is your heart. This is the new heart, the new spirit God's given you. It's, it's modus operandi. I think that's the way you say it. 
Its operative settings are to forgive and to walk in mercy. So it's actually not like you to not walk in forgiveness. Um, sin. You know, we, we, we talked a little bit about sin yesterday. Hamartia is the Greek word for sin. It means without form. I know a lot of us here, were, it's missing the mark. Well, no, missing the mark is what happens when you sin. Hamartia has to do with not partaking in what was intended because you are without the purpose that you were created for. You were created to walk in love and to look like the Father. And when you don't do that, you miss the mark of your created intended purpose. And so what Jesus does is he brings us back to looking like God, possessing his heart again, so that we can not miss the mark because we're operating according to the instructions. So all sin is, is not acting like God. <laughs> right? It's pretty simple. It's not this mysterious bad thing. You were created to love. It's easy stuff. So to forgive in the Greek is aphiemi. It literally means to send away or to depart or to let go. Think of a ship sailing away and you let go of the rope that's tying it to the dock and it goes off into sea and it's gone. To depart from, to leave. You're not holding, you're not grasping anything. Can I get, uh, can I get two little guys? Who wants, to, who wants to volunteer for a second? Okay, you two raise your hands. You two get up here. You should come right up, right up here. So I want you guys to take your hands and link them together. So I want you to grab your own hands, but first I want you to wrap them around the other person like this. Okay? So what I want you guys to do is I want you to get away from each other, but there's one rule. Okay? You can't let go of your hands. Go. Is there any way? Could you, like, crawl through there? Is that going to work? You can't find a single way? So the only way that you can be free from each other is if you what? If you let go. Let's see it. Hey, give it up. Thanks, boys. You can have a seat. The only way you can be free is if you let go. We have an obvious example in the life of Jesus. Luke 23, verse 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they, were, what they are doing. And they divided up clothes by casting lots. Jesus made excuses for his murderers as they were murdering him. Whew. Not later, not after he had had some alone time to think about it. As they were murdering him. So this guy is obviously living with a perspective that I need. Because that's not my gut reaction when I get offended. He didn't just say, Father, forgive them. He actually propped up a reason why he should. And do you think the Father did? You think God's like, no. <laughs> I think he must have. That's intense, eh? And what's beautiful is that we don't just have an example of that in Jesus. Um, when we jump into Acts 7, verse 59, we have the story of Stephen. Stephen. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, the last thing he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. <laughs> oh man, that's heavy, eh? And do you think he did? What you loose in heaven will be loosed on earth. Those you forgive will be forgiven. Those sins which you withhold are withheld. Intense, eh? And I'm not saying, I don't want you guys to hear like, 
this is what you should be doing, and if you're not doing it, you're bad. I'm saying, look at what these men operate in, and I want you to recognize what kind of spirit would they have to have to do that. They're not just doing it on a whim. Jesus wasn't just, well, this is right, so. Stephen wasn't just, well, I heard Jesus say it, so I better. They had a hold of a truth, of a revelation. They believed something. And this is the fruit of what they believed, was walking in forgiveness as they're being murdered. You see that? Don't see this as some standard that you have to pull off now that you're a Christian or else you're not good enough. You've been reconciled. You are above reproach without accusation, right? These aren't my ideas. We went over the scriptures. Without accusation, no finger pointing at you. You have been made. The balance is equal again. You are filled up in him. The scale is the same on both sides. You don't need to do something to be okay. Okay? With God. <laughs> we were talking the other morning about... Um, Reconciliation is the major theme of the Bible, right? It is the major theme. There was irreconcilable differences immediately in the garden. And then from Genesis to the Gospels, we have God's process of preparing and getting everyone ready for reconciliation. And then he accomplishes it on the cross. And so... God prepares the way. He sends John the Baptist. He gets Jesus on the scene. Hearts of the Father back to the children. Hearts of the children back to the Father. And the reason he did it was so that it wasn't just for reconciliation's sake, right? We talked about this yesterday. He wants to give you life and life in abundance. And it doesn't mean he just wants to wait until you're dead and then you go to heaven and then things are okay and you can, you can sort things out there and have a blast. Life and life in abundance here. That means enough life for you and enough life to give away. Right? And so part of that reconciliation process is that we actually learn to live a different way. Because God gave us operating instructions. He made us for love. He made us for forgiveness. He made us for mercy. He made us for peace. He made us for all those things. Most of you, if you had a bad growing up experience, you didn't need a friend to come and tell you that, hey, you don't have a great dad. You knew it, <laughs> right? Like your heart was pre-programmed for love. And when you don't receive it, things are twisted. Right? Right? There's, there's operating instructions. And one of the things Jesus set us free from was he set us free from sin. He set us free from destruction. He set us free from the way that seems right to us. He set us free from carnal thinking so that we could operate where he is. And so, yes, we have reconciliation. Yes, God is okay with us. Yes, you can take advantage of that. But what I want to learn is I want to learn to see the way Jesus did and operate the way Jesus did because that's going to bring as much life as I can possibly handle to me, and it's going to spread out to other people. It's a way. Jesus is the way. Right? So, I don't want you guys to hear condemnation. I don't want you guys to hear, oh, here's a measuring stick. If I'm going to be okay, you're okay with God. Okay? You're okay with God. He made sure of it. We established that you didn't even really get to vote before he decided to send his son while you were enemies. So now that you're not enemies, is there really anything you can do to screw that up? It's not possible. But our hearts were made to operate a certain way. And point number one, walking in forgiveness is a form of guarding your heart. So in Hebrews 12, verse 15, Um, The author says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. 
So when we walk in bitterness, when we take offense, and when we hold that thing, you don't even get to keep it to yourself. Bitterness springs up, and it defiles many. You don't get to keep your unforgiveness to yourself. It's a form of guarding our hearts. When we hold on to that, defilement happens. And I'm not saying God all of a sudden thinks you're bad and kicks you out of the family. No. But sin will twist things. It'll put your perspective off. It'll turn you. It'll it, offense, right? How easy is it to get offended and to cop an attitude and to, to, to have these reasons to be angry and to lash out and be hurt and to, to mope and to, to, to whine? In the ancient Middle East, Hebrew culture, um, what they often, what they called a poisonous plant, what we call poisonous plants, they called bitter. Oh, that's a bitter plant. And we, they understood that the plant contained poison that could kill you. So when Paul says, don't let a bitter root, he's, re- he, he's using their Middle Eastern language to say, that bitter root contains poison that can kill you and others around you. And I don't just want to say, you should forgive because it's a good thing to do. Like, we have to understand what our hearts were made for, what, how we were made to operate like him, how he sees, what perspective he lives from. Because I guarantee you, one of the, one of the most intense strategies of the devil is offense and unforgiveness. It is extremely effective. It is extremely effective at ripping apart a community. It's extremely effective at ripping apart marriages, family, all that stuff. It's his go-to. It's, it's, it's simple for him. And so when we walk in forgiveness, guys, like I'm talking like you can stop generational curses by walking in forgiveness. And what I mean by that is when you live a certain way and you, right, it, it defiles many people. So I'll share my own testimony. My dad, um, when I was a kid, he cheated on my mom and left, blew up the church. Um, a whole bunch of things fell out. I was nine years old. I was a little guy. Our family blew up. It was a small town. Word got around. There was a lot of shame involved with it. And the results of that very easily and did shape my heart. I don't remember, but I didn't talk for two weeks afterwards, apparently, my mom says. I was just silent. It was like someone just kicked me in the head, and I was stumbling around trying to figure things out. You know, if you follow certain families of criminals, even famous criminals in the past, like Al Capone and these, these famous guys from the past, their family lineages die out. If you have an alcoholic grandpa, there's a better chance you get an gr- alcoholic father, better chance you'll have alcohol in your family. That'll suffer from that, right? When we start seeing the strategy of the enemy, because that's what I want you guys to see. I don't want you to see this rule that you need to do. Because if you don't, then you bad. <laughs> I want you to see the strategy of unforgiveness in your life. The strategy is to create iniquity in your heart too. So when someone sins against me and I get bitter and hurt and unforgiveness, that iniquity forms itself in me. And it causes a bitter root to spring up. And by it, many become defiled. It's the multiplication process. Poof, 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 through the generations. From the great-grandfather down to the tiniest grandchild. It'll keep going. And you can literally end that cycle in your life. And cut that root off. And it never has to touch your offspring or anyone around you, by walking in forgiveness. That's powerful. And what we think is that, well, if I forgive, then it means that what they did is okay. No, it doesn't. We're going to go over what forgiveness doesn't mean in a little bit. But what it does mean is it gives you the opportunity to cut off the devil's strategy in your life to bring destruction for generations. That's pretty awesome. It's a nuclear bomb in the plans of the enemy, in your life. That make sense? (laughs) 
You guys okay? Number two, walking in forgiveness releases blessing. First Peter three Peter. First Peter three verse nine. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you have been called, that you may obtain a blessing. So there's literally the hand of God is shelling out gifts, man. When we walk in forgiveness, there's blessing, there's bountiful, there's, I mean, just the blessing of not passing off the hurt of my father to my children. Oh, what a gift. I couldn't ask, like, if I were to ask for one thing in my life, it's that my children would not feel that. And I got it because I followed him. And his grace was released on my life, and he empowered me with his spirit to walk in that forgiveness. My family's blessed because of it, guys. It is awesome. And I don't know what you went through, and I don't know what happened to you, but it's the same principle that can play out, okay? Number three, Walking in forgiveness plants seeds of mercy that you will harvest for yourself. Matthew 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Oh, yeah, I could use some of that, right? I need mercy too, man. You know what? There's this, uh, there's this story of the, do I get to it? Jesus tells this story of the wicked servant. Remember the story where the, um, this, this guy owes the king like a billion dollars of debt or something. And he goes to the king. He's like, listen, man. And they're like, this is like, I can take your wife and kids now. And they're going to work for me forever. You're done. Like, this is serious debt. This is ancient Middle Eastern debt where you don't just like, the CRA comes after you and you declare bankruptcy. Like, I'm taking your family, and I'm going to sell your kids. I'm going to try and get as much money back. You're dead. Dang. This guy, this king's like, no. You know what? I'll eat it. Don't worry about it. You're free to go. Woo! Oh, can you imagine the weight that comes off? You go home to your wife. Babe, guess what? You're not going to have to go work in the mines. Like, serious good news. Serious good news. Next day at work, he, he goes up to Joe, who owes him $50, and he grabs him by the neck, and he slams him against the wall. Like, can you imagine the heart that does that? Like, he slams him against the wall, and he says, pay me back what you owe me, and he chucks him in jail. And the king's servants are like, you guys just see that? Like, we were there when he got forgiven a billion dollars, and he's choking out Doug for 20 bucks? Okay, king. And it says that the king turns him over to the tormentors until every last bit gets ripped out of him. And this is a parable, okay? This is a story. Jesus is trying to, it's an allegory to portray an idea. When we walk in unforgiveness, there's torment. There's torment that occurs. It's a fact. And I don't want to be the kind of guy who's all up for receiving mercy and unwilling to give it. Right? Who wants to be that guy? Does that sound like an awesome hero that you want your kids to look up to? Not even close. And I know all of your hearts in there think that. And that's awesome. And I'm not saying you're that guy and God's going to torment you. I'm saying that imagine being that. Like the guy who got forgiven a billion dollars didn't see he did not understand the weight and the grace of God on his life of what's been removed from him. Because guys, I'm telling you, when you encounter reconciliation, when you see your debt cleared, when you understand the weight that Jesus took off of you, forgiveness becomes pretty easy. And I'm not saying that lightly. When you understand what the Lord's taken from you and what he has wiped out, it becomes very hard to hold people to the wall and choke them out for what they owe you. And so it's interesting that he says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Like we need to understand reconciliation. Because it sets you up to be a person who walks in mercy. 
And it's not this rule that you have to figure out. If you got forgiven a billion dollars tomorrow, and someone was like, hey, man, how do you feel about forgiving Doug for like, you'd be like, Doug's off the hook, dude. <laughs> I'm okay. Like, you know how easy that would be? It would be so easy. Easy. Everyone in here thinks that. So we need a revelation of the finished work of the cross in our lives. We need a revelation of the reconciliation that's taken place, guys. Because when that encounters your heart, it's a deal. It's like, oh, you got it. Whatever you want, man. And so this isn't about you trying to climb this ladder of, well, I'll work on my perfection and I'll try to be as forgiving because Jesus said to. It's not about that. That's not the starting place. The starting place is encountering the grace of the Father for yourself and letting that hit your heart and understanding that. And when that does its work in you, you'll look the same way. That's relationship, not religion. Amen? (laughs) So I have a couple questions for you because we talked about how important questions are. Good questions. We talked about bitterness. Um, it's a threat. It's a, we, we, you, we all have stories we can say of how bitterness has destroyed things in our lives. We all know this. Um, if you avoid forgiveness, how can you avoid bitterness? That's a good question. If you avoid forgiveness, then explain to me how you avoid bitterness. And here's the thing. This ties really well into the, um, the story that you, we just heard. In, in my brother or sister's offense against me, is the blood of Jesus enough to cleanse this sin from them? Right? We're changing our perspective. We're seeing things from the throne. I'm telling you guys, this isn't just a rule you should do because it's a good idea. Like, Stephen saw something. Jesus had an understanding. They had perspective. They weren't just doing it because it's, it's a rule somewhere in there. Forgive others. They had perspective. They understood the strategy of the enemy against them. They understood what was at stake. They under, Well, Stephen understood what had been lifted off of his life. Jesus didn't need that. But they could see, they could see that unforgiveness is a strategy against your life to bring defilement to many around you. So if you avoid forgiveness, how can you avoid bitterness? And is the blood of Jesus enough to cleanse this sin from them? So now we're going to talk a little bit about what forgiveness is not, okay? Because I am by no means trying to, and, and, and we're hitting this, we're hitting this from, um, we're hitting this from an oppressor-victim scenario tonight. I know forgiving yourself is a huge topic too, a huge topic. Um, I just think it's appropriate to talk about it this way because of the season we just came through, <laughs> and, and ask me how I know, okay? I'm, I'm in this world too. But what forgiveness is not? Forgiveness between people does not mean that trust is reestablished. If someone hurts your kids, you can forgive them from your heart. But it does not mean you have to hire them as your babysitter. Right? Jesus, when he implores us to forgive... He's not setting up an atmosphere for predators to flourish. Because those people are out there too. It does not mean trust is reestablished. It doesn't mean you allow them into your inner circle again. To, to do what they can. Right? You can still forgive. But it doesn't mean trust is reestablished. It does not mean that everything in your relationship is peachy keen now. So for me, um, when, when my dad left, that hurt. 
big time in ways that I couldn't even express as, at nine years old. I didn't know what happened. I knew it didn't involve me, but <laughs> there's pain, right? And it, I think me, I have two older sisters. Each one of us reacted differently. It was interesting. But it doesn't mean, when you forgive someone, it doesn't mean that everything between you is right and perfect and good. Obviously, it doesn't mean that what happened was okay. I don't think I have to say that. When you forgive someone, it does not mean you're saying what they did was okay. The fact that forgiveness is even on the table acknowledges that what they did wasn't okay. Right? You wouldn't need to forgive if what they did was great. So I, I think that's, that, that's clear. It does not mean that the other person doesn't have serious problems they may need to deal with. <laughs> um, if you've been hurt by someone who's extremely selfish, forgiving them does not mean that that's not still a problem for them. Or if someone betrayed you, right, because of selfishness. If someone ripped you off from a business deal, if a family member did something, if there's all sorts of stuff that happens. man. I don't even want to know the stories in here because it's probably horrific. But it doesn't mean that they still don't have serious problems that you need to be aware of, right? This is kind of ties in with the trust thing. Um, forgiveness does not mean instant healing for the wound or the trauma you experienced. Interesting one, hey? I, pro I, I still have stuff I'm dealing with psychologically from what happened with my dad. Have I forgiven him and released him? Totally. I'm not holding him against that. I bless him. I named my kid after him. My son's name is Boaz Rick. Dad's name is Rick. Like, I, I honor him. I love him. I, I love what I got from him. The good he did give, it was good. But when you're, especially when you're young and stuff happens to you, things just get twisted. And, and, and I love that the Father, the Father, is walking me through that stuff my entire whole life. Um, it comes up every once in a while. Things come up. And I'm not hunting for the trauma in my life to try and figure everything out. I'm not, I'm not constantly in self-introspection mode. I'm trusting that he's made me whole. He's filling up all the gaps in my life. And if there's stuff that I need to deal with from past things, he's going to bring it about in his time and we're going to deal with it and I'm going to be free. Freer. Does that make sense? So it does not mean that it didn't hurt or that all the pain is gone when you choose to forgive someone. You don't have to wait until all the hurt and pain is gone to feel like you've forgiven them. That's not it. Remember, think about a ship leaving a harbor, about letting go. Forgiveness means, and this is my opinion, you can take it or leave it. It means you are deciding that an offense committed against you is going to be canceled out. Is the blood of Jesus enough for this person? That's a great question to ask. Is the blood of Jesus enough for this person? Any sort of payment, revenge, or requirement of them to reimburse you is canceled. It means you are going to speak a blessing and not a curse over their life. And when you think about and encounter them, you are going to endeavor to help improve their quality of life. <laughs> I'm not saying you have to invite them over for dinner and be best buds, okay? That's not what I'm saying. You know, I'm sure you've all heard this principle before. If you get a nasty idea about someone or a nasty thought or a nasty motive, do the opposite. If there's an opportunity to give and you don't want to give, it's probably a good idea to give. Right? Just like, yeah, push back. Push back against that thing. If you see someone who's hurt you and you go, oh, you dirty. You know what, Lord? I just bless them in the name of Jesus Christ. Remember this morning I was talking about my friend who sings and it annoyed me. Instead of cursing him out in my mind, I started blessing him in my mind as he's saying it annoyed me, and my heart totally changed towards him. That's a stupid example, but it plays out. Blessing them, praying for them. Their offense toward you will not be the primary lens through which you view them. 
And I know that's a hard one. Um, scripture says we, we view no one according, therefore we, we, we view no one according to the flesh. Now, like I said, it doesn't mean trust is established. It doesn't mean the relationship's peachy keen. It doesn't mean you don't have hurt to deal with. But when you, and I'm just speaking from example of what I did with, with my dad and stuff. Like, he called me, he called me a failure as a son. I confronted him on a few issues one time. I said, Dad, you weren't there when I needed you. Um, I, ne- I didn't hear from you for months, months and months and months at a time, at a very tender age. And he said, well, my failure as a father is also your failure as a son. And then he went for a hug. <laughs> so I'm not saying this stuff flippantly. <laughs> I laugh about it because I'm, I'm whole, and I also think, my God, what, what happened that you would say that to your child? You know, it actually makes my heart sad for him that you, you could be capable of saying that to your own child. Good Lord, what happened? What happened? Have mercy, God. I'm not the one in trouble, guys. He's the one who's in trouble. And that's a great perspective to hold. When you get hurt by someone, when they wound you, you're not the one who's in trouble. The person who has a kind of heart who can even do that needs rescuing. And instead of crying out because of them, why don't we learn, like the father, to cry out for them? God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Pull them out of that mess because the heart that they're displaying right now is hurt and wicked and wounded. They need, they need mercy. <laughs> because I've been reconciled. Because I'm whole. I'm okay. I'm good. I'll, I'll lick my wounds. The Lord's going to bring this about. He's going to establish my life. But they're in trouble. Whew. What if we could have that perspective? I, I bet you that's what Jesus was thinking. And this is my, this is my favorite part. Matthew 5, verse 44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Verse 45. Why? Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. That. So there's a reason you're doing that that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. We we always, I I don't know, maybe it's just me, I really want to be like God. (laughs) I really want to be like Jesus. I, I love who the man who I have encountered in Christ. And I want to be like that. And when I love my enemies and I pray for those who have hurt me, I get to be just like him. That's pretty sweet. I get to be just like God. And in the face of every demon and every devil and every strategy of hell, he's saying I get to be like him in this situation. I get to cut off the strategy of the enemy to bring pain, destruction, and bitterness into my life that's going to reproduce itself and defile other people through me, and I get to stomp on the head of that snake right here, right now. And every time I do, Christ's victory is established again in my life, and the devil has to eat the fact that Jesus saved another one. Oh, <laughs> Like, this is big picture, man. It's really good to keep a big picture. Because this is not just about you and your little life. There, your, your life is, in fact, so important that it, it, what's the cheesy way? It echoes through eternity. Right? You're not just a blip in a pond. What you do has ramifications. The devil's not paying attention to you because you're a nobody. He's not committed to crushing the life of Christ in you because you're useless. If you get a hold of these keys of the kingdom, it's going to be an expensive day for the devil. It's going to be expensive. 
And he didn't get that in my life in that way, what he was planning on bringing me through my dad. Didn't happen. In fact, the Lord utterly and completely, oh, I forgot. I've, I've taught this before and I forgot about this, man. Okay, so my dad was extremely, he was prophetically gifted heavily. He had an, uh, he had a, I believe, and what other people have told me who knew him and were good friends with him, he had a grasp on things ahead of his time. Um, he was moving in healing. He was moving in the prophetic. He, he understood a lot of the stuff we're talking about here back in the late 80s, early 90s. And he was teaching it. I have tapes of his that talk about healing, that talk, like the stuff that I'm in. I didn't know this. So um, when was it? I guess it was last year, 2021, my sister and I get a box in the mail, and it's, I won't get into all the details, but it's from my, it's from my dad's new wife, so my stepmom, who he cheated on my mom with, and I haven't seen her in 10 years, 11 years, and it's a box of a bunch of his old things, and I don't know why she decided to ship it to us 10 years after he died, doesn't matter. <laughs> but in it is a, uh, a folder, probably this thick, of my dad's personal handwritten sermon notes. And I opened them up and I started reading them. And I, I burst into ugly cry for like 15, 20 minutes. Because everything I read in there was all of the things that I received anyways. Everything I'm talking to you guys about, he was talking about in the, in the early 90s. And I was supposed to get that from him. And I didn't. And it was robbed. And God came and he gave it to me anyways. <laughs> like he fathered me. And what was supposed to be a legacy from my dad that, that the enemy tried to rob, my God gave back to me. Through ways I had no idea were coming. And I read through his sermon notes. And I'm not even kidding you guys. It's like I wrote them. It was the same language. It was the same examples. It actually freaked me out. It made me feel a little less sure about complete sovereign free will in my life because I felt like a little bit like a robot reading what my dad wrote, and I'm saying the same things, and I'm preaching on the same subjects, and I've highlighted the same stuff. It freaked me out. He utterly filled up what was lacking in my life. And he brought amazing men into my life to father me and to be that masculine presence that I needed. It wasn't just one, it was numerous. But he filled my cup up, man. He utterly, utterly filled my cup up. What was, what was robbed from me was restored seven times. And I wept. I wept so long because of the good, we sang about it, the goodness of God. Whew. And I, did, I didn't even know it. I didn't even know it till last year. How good he's been to me throughout the decades since all this stuff went down. And guys, man, I promise you, if I'd uh, held on to anger and bitterness, and allowed that to form my life, I would not be up here talking to you about it. Talk about, and I'm not taking any credit here, I'm just saying there's tremendous blessing when you walk in the way that the Lord wants us to walk. You're not losing. You're not giving anything up. You're laying down what you were never meant to carry in the first place. And you're allowing the Lord to take responsibility and father and shape, and take care of you. And you're not allowing any other hand in your life to have that privilege. 
That's what forgiveness is about. I will not be formed by any man's actions towards me. That's my father's job. So I'm going to release you, let this go, and bless you like he would because I'm just like him. And I'm going to cut off the enemy's plans for my life. And I hope that when you experience mercy from me, you get a smell of what it's like being a son of the father and that your heart gets called back to him. <sighs> oh, you guys feel that? It's pretty real. Love keeps no record of wrongs. And the Bible tells us to love our enemies. And so in order to love our enemies, we must forgive them. Because love is not keeping records. The highest call. The purest manifestation of Jesus Christ to walk in love. And he's, ne- he's not asking you to do, so- to do something that he didn't do first. He's the, a wonderful captain, a wonderful shepherd, and you can trust your heart with him. <sighs> so we're going to respond to this word right now. And I'm just going to encourage you guys to go into your heart a little bit. And I want you just to think and ask if, and maybe it comes quick, but if there's anybody in your life who you want to release, who you've been holding in that place of unforgiveness that it's been affecting. And I'm not saying, guys, please don't hear it. Please don't hear it from a, you need to do this to be okay. You need to do this to, to pass the test. You need to do this to, that, that's not what this is. This is everything that I just talked about. It's walking in victory. Allow the Holy Spirit to just bring someone up to your mind if there's anything. It might be small, it might be big. And we're just gonna we're just gonna release them before the Lord. So Jesus, and you guys can just agree with me in your heart. You don't have to say it out loud, and you don't have to agree. <laughs> but Jesus, Father God, we just we just lift this person up to you, Lord. We've been holding them in a place of bondage and a place of bitterness for too long. And so, Lord, right now, because of your goodness, because of the mercy we've experienced at your hand, we're going to operate in the same thing by your grace, and we release this person right now in Jesus' name. From anything they owe me, from any pain they've brought in my life, God, would you bless them? Would you make your face shine upon them and be gracious unto them? Father, may you make what's lacking in their heart. Would you make it whole? Father, would you bring repentance? Would you bring peace? Would you set them free from the snares of the enemy? I command any strategy of the enemy, any demonic presence or source or being that's been fueling that unforgiveness or Sowing that bitterness, we command you to leave now in Jesus' name. Off of me and every person here, no torment in Jesus' name. Go. Father God, we're committing to walking this forgiveness journey out. Thank you that you are lowly and humble of heart and that you understand our weaknesses, God. You're not looking at us with your arms crossed and your, your eyebrow cocked, saying, well, when are you going to get this done with? You've come right down into the dirt with us. You've held us by the hand, and you're committed to helping us walk in freedom and victory because that's what this is. We thank you so much for your humbleness, Jesus. Thank you so much. We don't have to be formed and shaped by the strategies of evil. Thank you that you don't just keep us from that, but you restore everything that's been stolen. And I prophesy that over every heart and every mind here tonight, Lord, that what's been robbed through the strategy of the enemy, God, that you would restore it seven times. That the blessing that you promised would come through walking in mercy would come in Jesus' name. 
Holy Spirit, would you touch, would you fill, would you begin that process? In every heart here tonight that's been wounded, God. Father, may the enemy regret ever having touched a single soul here. May it be way too expensive and cost him way too much. May the redemption be so profound, God, that he's in shock of the goodness of God. Wreck us with your mercy, Jesus. I just saw a picture of this this oil of joy and gladness. It's like we all had these cups out, and the, the Lord was just filling those up. I just feel like if you've been in a place of despair and of pain and of trauma for a long time, the Lord's going to fill your cup. He's going to fill it with joy and gladness. That's your inheritance. In his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. What has marked you, what has tried to form you, what has tried to have it lordship over you will have it no longer. The word says he's jealous for the soul that's inside of you. It means he wants it, it's his. He wants to take responsibility. He wants to form, he wants to fashion. And he's going to remove every idol that's tried to set itself up in your life through abuse. Holy Ghost, we just welcome you. We acknowledge your sweetness and your goodness, Lord. Would you touch our hearts? Touch your people, God. Life in abundance. Yeah, he is a healer. He is a healer. Comforter, the healer. Holy Spirit, we love you so much. Goodness.
for his goodness and his mercy endure forever. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, that we have been reconciled. Lord, may you awaken each one of our hearts more and more and more to the weight of that revelation, God. May we understand and be formed and fashioned by your mercy, by your goodness, by your plan for our lives. Lord, may the cross and what you accomplished there and what and the resurrection that took place after be the most important, biggest deal to us in our lives. May the seeds you planted in our hearts go deep. May the roots go deep and may the fruits spring up and be much. Multiply, Lord, what you've done in your son. Multiply it in us. We want it, Lord. We want great fruit. We want multiplication, Jesus. And we want the fruit that's produced to spread all around the world into every relationship in our sphere, God, that people would taste and see from our fruit that the Lord is good. Yeah. So I speak that over your lives tonight. Fruit that remains. The fruit of reconciliation, the fruit of righteousness, your inheritance in the saints, Bought and paid for by the blood of the Lamb. Guys, the Lamb has been slain. I'll say it again. In all of the sacrifices that were offered in the Old Testament, in the temple system, not one time was the person who offered the sacrifice inspected. It was always the sacrifice that was inspected. And we have a perfect sacrifice. The priests never asked them, asked them, have you been paying your tithes? How well have you done this week? Did you steal? How's your thought life? How's your devotional time? All they did was inspect the sacrifice, and it was acceptable and perfect. And Jesus is our sacrifice. So guys, let's just rest in that tonight. Let's walk in it. Let's let's like be that. Let that be the water that you. Let that be the water you drink. Let that be a source of life for you. Ask the Holy Ghost. Get alone again. Personally ask him, Lord, make this a big deal in my heart. Remove any shade. Remove any bondage. Remove any darkness that's keeping me from walking in greater revelation of this. I'm trusting you with this, God. Thank you for helping me walk this out in my own life. Because it is glory. Amen. I'll leave you guys with that. So Jesus, I mean, I just prayed, but I'll, I'll officially close. Jesus, we just love you. What a man. <laughs> what a man. Father, thank you for sharing your son with us. Thank you for sending him to rescue us from what was killing us. You have shown your great love for us many times over, but most profoundly in the cross. While we were still sinners, you died. How much more now that we are reconciled do we get to experience what it's like being fathered by you? Thank you for being such a good daddy. Amen. Uh, thank you, thank you, Daniel, for um, your authentic vulnerability with us. Um, I think this is an example of confessing our sins one to another. When we share our spaces, when we share, when we share our struggles, when we share our victories, um, we can learn and we can grow together. So thank you very much for that.
Um, and I was just thinking this, the atmosphere feels so heavy, um, but there's so much joy in this atmosphere. There's freedom. There's freedom to take from the message that we've been given tonight. And I was sitting there thinking, oh, going, no, wait a minute. I'm, I'm actually free. I get to choose to stand up in freedom right now, um, in a deeper understanding of freedom than, than I had an hour ago. So I welcome you guys to, to stand up in your freedom to stand up in the gift of forgiveness that we have been given, um, and to join us in the coffee shop, <laughs> so we can we can keep talking, we can keep these thoughts, we can keep these thoughts going. Um, our our Esther is is hosting this evening, and she's got some dips and crackers and cheese and lots of fun stuff down there. So take your time, take your time, but come over and, and meet us there when you're ready. Thanks, everybody.